As a believer, even. Right? Amen. You know, everybody, you know, that is in love with God and everybody that's a part of the uh, uh, ministry, man, they're just lifted up their hands and they're crying and they're worshiping and they're having a good old time with God. You ever been there? And you're standing there. Especially when you don't know nothing about anything. So what are these people doing, man? Worship is something most people don't understand until they become a worshiper. And worshiping is something that happens when you fall in love with Jesus. Now, I, I said all that to say this. Because on a A group of people that know nothing about worship. That's why we do our worship on Wednesday. Well, so that we can capture them that don't want to get captured on Sunday. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna come check this thing out, and you get you know pr praise is something everybody get into. Music will get your soul going. If you know God or don't know God, music will get your soul going. So that's why we don't have a mixture of worship and praise on Sunday morning. We praise. We shout. We make a proclamation of his goodness. Amen. And if you're the kind of believer that likes worship and nothing wrong with that, I like worship too. Amen. Come back on a Sunday, a Wednesday rather, and you'll get a part of that. Amen. This is why we don't do something new. On a, on, a, on a Sunday, but they talked me into it. <laughs> Amen. Anyhow, are you ready for the word? Yes. Amen. We're going to get right into it. This is week 26 of a series called Stop Believing Satan's Lies. And I believe that this series, again, is probably the most timeliest series that has ever been preached in this pulpit. We are being inundated with lies. And unfortunately, the, you know, uh, um, many believers are falling susceptible to these lies, not being aware of what's going on. And the scripture says that in, in the last days, unless God shortened the days, even the very elect can be deceived. All right? For those believers that have been saved a long time, you know, I got 40 years, 41 years, and I've been hearing for 40, 41 years that we are in the last days. We are in the last days. And there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it, man. We just finished you know, a thing where they uh, uh, took control and authority over the churches with the lockdown, the pandemic, and all this other stuff. And churches surrendered their authority, and they closed and obeyed the government rather than obeying God. Now there's a new one coming out. You ready for it? Monkeypox. The difference between this one is... The World Health Organization has been given the authority over 19 nations to declare a, a, a federal emergency and shut the country down. If the church don't wake up and realize who we are supposed to represent and what we are supposed to be in this world, we're going to lose many, many believers. And the, and the consequence of losing many believers is that a lot of people aren't going to understand the power of an almighty God. See, many people are not serving a powerful God. They're serving a God on the cross. They're serving a God in the tomb, but not serving the resurrected Savior. Amen. Satan has caused the culture of today's church to diminish the power of an almighty God. Believers are living with a diminished God. You know what I mean by diminished God? He's only able to do what you allow him to do. What you're willing to allow him to do in your life. The Bible says with God all things are possible. There's no diminishing his, his real power within himself. You only diminish it within yourself. 
And I've, you know, over this last 40, 41 years, I've come to realize that the majority of believers have lost their faith. And they're still sitting in church, still carrying a Bible, still singing, still preaching, still doing all the things they used to do. But they lost their faith because the power of God is diminished in their life and they're not seeing the victory in anybody else's life. Come on, somebody say amen. One of the commonly accepted lies that's perpetuated in the church today is that God is not supreme. You know what I mean, that God is supreme? So we don't preach God's not supreme, but we do things within the church to imply he's not supreme. You know, I, I'm going to make a lot of enemies because what, what I'm going to talk about is financially advantageous and it creates jobs. Some people are destined, according to the, doc, the, 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 the dictates of the pulpits today, are destined to suffer with pain, addictions, and misery forever. There's never a way out for them. And the way that we show them that, now I don't know about you, but my Bible says with God all things are possible. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, behold, all things are created new. So all the churches across America have adopted and adapted uh, secular society's uh, 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 responses to addictions and pain and misery and brought it in the church because it's financially advantageous. Hello? What am I talking about? 12-step program. Now, I know I'm going to make some people angry right now because you believe in that. Let me tell you something. I was an addict. I was an alcoholic. God delivered me, set me free by the power of an almighty God. Without 12 steps, I took one to the altar, and he did it. Never, ever, ever after he delivered me did I have a desire for drugs again. Not one time, well, one time and one time only. And it was a few years after I'd been saved, and I woke up, and I was sick. I was physically sick, and, and, and I had a desire to get loaded. And I questioned God, God, what happened? Why do I want to do this, man? I've been free for a couple years. And he led me to my medicine chest. And you know, drug addicts and alcoholics, we got a what? <laughs> what kind of tolerance we got? We got high tolerance, man. Yeah. Amen. So I went to my, my NyQuil because I was sick. I took two and a half cups. And I woke up wanting to use. And the Holy Spirit led me to that and told me to read the contents. And it said, alcohol, 12% by volume. And here's what the Spirit of God said to me. He said, within you and every other addict lies a seed of addiction. You woke it up. You woke it up. So I learned not to wake it up. Now, how do I know I've been delivered? Because I backslid, went back out there and couldn't go back to what, the, what God brought me out of because I realized it was nothing but a lie. I couldn't go back to it because I had experienced truth. So I'm talking truth. I'm talking something that I know that God can set you free if you want to be free and stop using excuses. God said, I will share my glory. Now, listen to me. I'm not, I'm not saying it's bad. Because it's a good place to start. Right. Amen. But when you're stuck in it for five, ten, one day at a time, right. sweet Jesus. Right. Right. Amen. Nothing wrong with one day at a time with Jesus, but I ain't living my deliverance one day at a time. I stepped into eternity, and I never have to worry about it again because he set me free. We diminish the power of God by employing God, uh, worldly principles in the church thinking that they're going to work. They are not going to work. The churches are doing a disservice to the men and women of God. There are men and women that need God, and we're doing a disservice to the power of God. Amen. I understand it creates jobs. Many people that were, were, were addicts are now in recovery programs and they're counseling. That's a good thing. It's creating jobs, so they're going to defend it, that we need it. How weak is God that I need to do step three over and over and over again? Think about it. How weak is God that I got to keep calling on my accountability partner when my Bible tells me, call upon me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things. He didn't say call my accountability partner. You can be free. 
from your addictions. You can be free from your pain. I read a Facebook post the other day, and you know, I feel sorry for these people. I feel sorry for people that, that, that bemoan their problems and don't understand the solution is dwelling down on the inside of them. Jesus said, I will be in you, and I will dwell in you, and I will be your God. They're looking outside, outward, for the deliverance that they need because they're believing the lies of the pulpit. This Facebook post, this individual wrote, I struggle with mental illness, and I guess I'm going to have to struggle with it all of my life. I've accepted that. That ain't what my Bible says. My Bible tells me about a man that used to run around in the tombs cutting himself and, 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 and doing harm to himself. The whole village was scared of him, wanted nothing to do with him until Jesus showed up. And the man was clothed and in his right man, mind, and the whole village came to find out what was happening to him. I had a man that they brought to us out of, uh, uh, straight out of Napa to our men's home that he, could, he would not talk to you. He would sit there and he would do this until you tell him to move. And he'd do this and he'd do this until you told him to move. And he'd tell him to sit and he'd sit and he never responded, didn't do a thing. Through the power of God, the power of prayer, association with the word of God, praying over him day and night, the power of God delivered him, set him free. He initiated conversation, started reading his Bible, and became normal again till he had a day of reckoning with accountability. He was free under the power of God. Now, I know I got a line of people to dispute this, but I'm going to tell you something. I know what I know what I know what I know. And I know that God is able. One day, he's in the kitchen. He's washing dishes, and he goes, what? He goes, oh, yeah, I don't want this. Start talking to this demon and flip right back where he's at. That means God wasn't able. He made a conscious choice. Yeah. Just like many are making a conscious choice to reject the power of God because it costs you something to get it. We were serving uh, 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 Wednesday and, and, and somebody told Sister Linda about, I think it was her back was hurting or something like that. And Sister Linda told her, well, do some exercise. She goes, it's easier to take a pill. How many of you know it's easier to follow the ways of the world than yes. it is God? Right yes. Amen. So if I'm involved in this 12-step program, I'm not accountable for my actions because after all, I'm only on step two again. I love kids. Amen. There's one time one of the kids asked somebody, well, how long have you been in recovery? They said, about 12 years. Said, well, how long does it take you to recover? See, believing the lies of the devil will make us doubt the power of God and question his reality. And we'll have a misconception of the power of God and what he has for us and we'll even get angry at God. How are you going to trust God, believe God, love God when he doesn't give you a fair shake? Come on. I've seen another Facebook post and I feel sorry for this individual. They, they, they lost their mother. And they said, well, pray for my peace because my mom got her wings. We don't get wings. If you don't understand the graduation process, you're going to be mad at God when your loved one graduates. God took them from me. God did not take them from you. Their time was up. It's appointed for man to die. We're supposed to prepare ourselves for that day. And what happened is the body of Christ, the preachers, the pulpits do not prepare you to prepare for that day and any other day that comes your way. So they're going to be mad at God and live foolishly. Many, many men and women struggle needlessly because of the lies they believe. It diminishes their confidence and their trust in God. So it's just shadows of what we were when we first got saved. Can you remember when you first got saved? How high your hopes were? God could do everything and anything. There was no doubt in your mind of his ability and his power. And then you fell into the foolishness. Deliverance is available for you if you truly want it. Now I'm going to talk to some of you that are sitting here. If you stop playing games, start being real. Stop being religious. And remember how far you have fallen. Come on, somebody say Amen. So you have to seek this. you got to really want it. Jeremiah chapter 17. 
How much are you willing to give up of yourself to find God? See, the problem with the body of Christ today is we say we want God, but we're too selfish. We're too selfish with our time. We want to watch TV. We want to go on vacations. We want to feast. We want to do all the things that our flesh wants us to do, but we do not want to deny and sacrifice ourselves to win the world. Where, where, where is your desire? Where is your hunger to see men and women saved? Soul winning is a lost art in the churches today. We want to gather together and pour into one another, but we don't want to do a sacrifice to win souls. Or well, we will if there's a whole bunch of people with us. But how about if you go by yourself? I can tell you how many times I was in Foothill, 23rd, East 14th, by myself, 10, 11 at night, not looking for a crowd because the Holy Spirit was with me and he guided me. Asked for a crowd and they didn't want to come anyway. Let's read Jeremiah 17, 5. Thus saith the Lord, cursed with great evil is the strong man who trusts in and relies on frail man. You know what he's saying? You're cursed when you rely on man's principles to get you what God has for you. So we got a 12-step program in our church. Yeah, you got a 12-step program because the man, the, 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 the organization that sells those programs costs $12.95 or $19.95 per book plus the student book plus the, plus the teacher book. They're making money. You're making money by having the meetings. It's a money-making scheme. Come on, you might not like what I'm saying, but you know you've been thinking about it. I'm not beating nobody up. I'm exposing the lies in the church and stopping you from finding God. A 12-step program is not what God called you to, get, uh, uh, to utilize to get saved. If you need it, you start there, but you don't end up there. You don't stay there. <laughs> I went to one 12-step meeting in my life before I got saved. I was in jail. And the board, the board tells me, who are you trying to impress? I guess not you. <laughs> so I can't come here and step into a program thinking I'm going to get something when it was the arm of flesh that designed it. And it don't design it for freedom's sake. It designs you for bondage sake. Because one meeting a day is not enough. Two meetings a day is not enough. All day long, I'm thinking about, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, I'm, I, I, I need help, I need help, I need to drink, I want to drink, I want to get loaded, I want to get high. I, who can I talk to? Thank God that the Holy Spirit is available and accessible to them that want to find him in spite of or in spite of man-made principles. He says you're cursed if you're relying on man-made principles. One scripture says, some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Amen. I made a confession one day when I found the Lord, and I said, God, I don't know if you're real, but if you're real, take this away from me, because I can't stop. I, you know, Prove yourself to me. The moment I said that, the power of God came in and transformed my life. Thank you, Jesus. But I had to make a commitment after that. Every day I had to make a commitment after that that I'm going to keep going forward. I didn't, decide, I didn't go back. I kept going forward. And God kept proving himself. And, and, you know, I know I'm one of those weird, or strange, or now and then preachers that, that don't buy into all that because I've seen the bondage that, it comes, in, that comes with it. Amen. Call on me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things. Ephesians 3 and 20 tells us that God is able to do super abundantly above all that we can ask or imagine or even think. Does the imagination to your freedom, is it limited to meetings? Your deliverance, is it, is, is it limited to your psychiatrist office visit? Let me share something. Psychiatrists, are, they're jokes. I'm talking to you as one who's seen dozens of psychiatrists. I went in there, had more fun with them than they had with me. Serious, man. I needed some entertainment. I get out of my cell. I get to go see my psych. And we get to talk for 20, 30 minutes to get a change of environment. Do you hear voices all the time? 
Do you think you're God's secret agent? Doesn't everybody? <laughs> they take it verbatim. You're telling them the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so they write it down. Well, let me give him this script. I'll say what I had to say to get a script. I didn't care. But I'm watching them and go, man, how gullible are these people? I'm, I'm as sane as anybody else, but they think I'm insane because I'm answering their questions the way they want me to answer them. It's a game. It's a game. And the Holy Spirit exposes that game. The Apostle Paul, he was concerned about the church being robbed by Satan. See, there was a time the Church of Jesus Christ in America was a powerful house. When the evangelists and the apostles came into town, especially the West Coast, the West Coast is rich in spiritual history. Up and down the West Coast, rich in spiritual history, where they had healing houses where people would stay there. They'd bring them out of the hospitals in the early 1900s, and they stay in these, in these houses for four, five, six weeks, get fed the word of God. Then they have a tent meeting, and after they fed them the word for six, four to six weeks, because the scriptures of Psalm 107, verse 20, he sent his word and healed them. Today, man wants to take glory. I'm going to be God's man of power for the hour. I'm going to anoint you with oil in Jesus' name. It's going to happen. How many being anointed with oil in Jesus' name prayed over you and nothing happened? Because you weren't filled with the word. They filled them with the word first. And when they prayed over them, they had enough faith in the word to obtain the healing that they were looking for. It's the truth anyhow. Rich in spiritual history. So the enemy came by and diluted the power of God in the church by promoting lies in the church. The Apostle Paul was concerned about the early church that the enemy did not creep in. He calls them enemies of the cross. We have enemies of the cross sitting in the churches today that want to dispute messages like this because it don't fit their agenda or it doesn't line up with what they think is right. Amen. Come on. God said, my ways are not your ways. As far as the heavens are from the earth, that's how far my ways are from your ways. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He was concerned about the churches being robbed. We ought to be concerned about believers being robbed of their identity in God. Amen. Enough to where we start seeking God and portraying God. Let's read 2 Corinthians. But now I am even fearful, lest that even as the serpent beguiled Eve by his cunning, so your minds may be corrupted and seduced from wholehearted and sincere and pure devotion to Christ. He told the church, he says, I'm concerned that your faith and trust in God is going to be surrendered over to man-made doctrines, surrendered over to the apostle, prophet, preacher, teacher. You know how we're all hung up on titles? We're all hung up on looks. If I ran around with my title, Reverend Mike Cambra, and had a shirt and tie on with alligator shoes and a jewelry to match and had my hair cut and my rim glasses, man, to look the part, half of the people that reject me would accept me. Because now I look the part. John the Baptist did not look the part. The Bible says he's a wild man at the, uh, down at the river. Eating wild locusts and honey with a full beard and a camel coat jack, jacket. Now those of you with mustaches and beard know what it's like to eat something sloppy. <laughs> hey man, I eat a taco and I'm like this. He's eating honey. He did not look he did not look like the religious leaders of their time. But Jesus spoke on his behalf. He says, what did you go out in the wilderness to see? Did you go looking for something that would shake with the wind? He goes, no, you've seen a prophet. He said, you don't, don't look at what you think you see because I look on the heart. Amen. Stop trying to conform to everybody else's image of what you think a Christian is supposed to look like. Hello. God sets you free based on your heart, not your clothing. Man, you, 
could look beautiful in your church hat. Yeah. Hey, Amen. Your long flowing church dress all the way to your knees and covered up here and covered up here and be full of the devil. Yeah. Putting people in bondages. The power of God is supposed to be active and alive in the churches and attracting. Yeah. It's supposed to be attractive, yeah. not detracting, yeah. but attractive. Yeah. It's not your personality. The lies in the church today is, is that the church is built on the personality of the preachers. And if the preacher isn't big enough, we're going to call in this preacher here, and he's well known, and we're going to pay them their $10,000 gate charge to come in and give them 100% of the offerings and 100% of the book sales just so we can get them in because their name draws. They ain't nobody draw like the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the name that will draw everybody and everybody. How do you, I've worked with organizations, I've worked with churches, I've worked with the Oakland Council churches, and we draw people in. And that was the tactics they used to draw people in to build up their ministry. Come on, somebody say amen. Paul said, I ain't playing these games. I ain't playing the church games. I'm not attacking, but I'm telling you the lies of the devil is stopping the power of God from being in the churches and is stopping the power of God from being in your life because you want it to be the norm. You may came in from another church. You're trying to filter in what didn't work in that church to make it work here. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Paul said, I ain't playing these games. He said, I'm exposing these lies. Amen. And I was in past into a state of weakness and fear, dread and great trembling after I had come among you. What are you saying? I'm, I'm coming here to see you. And my language and my message were not set forth in persuasive, enticing words, plausible words of wisdom. He said, I didn't come at you with enticing words of men's wisdom, but in demonstration and power of the Holy Ghost. He said, I'm not coming here trying to break down Greek and Hebrew. I'm not coming here trying to tell you how far Samaria is from Jerusalem. I'm not going to give you the background information, which means absolutely nothing, but it helps you see how smart I am. Hello? And Paul was not an ignorant man. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel. He was a, he was a Jew's Jew. He knew the law. And he said, I count that all as dung that I may know him. He said, I'm not coming at you in my wisdom, but I'm coming at you in demonstration and power of the Holy Ghost. Where's the demonstration of power of the Holy Ghost? You stop speaking in tongues. Oh, hallelujah. We don't practice the baptism of tongues. We don't practice the baptism of fire. We're not Pentecostal no more. We're dead charismatics. Because we don't want to offend nobody. My God, I got saved in the church that the Holy Ghost moved by every single service. We had, we had a wooden pews. Amen. And every service, the pews had to get back in place. Every service, the women were carrying their wigs. Every service, the Holy Ghost come in and people were sweating. That's right. That's Looked like a big dance hall. That's right. Today you come in, you leave just the way that you came in. Yep. Come on now. We have unheartfelt worship. Come on. Because you bring your problems in the church instead of understanding because you don't know the truth about this. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. You came in arguing, you leave arguing. Well, Jesus did not come that you could live a defeated life. You've been robbed. Each and every one of us in here have been robbed. You were a target the moment you were born. Moses was a target the moment he was born. Every child to and under was a target when Moses was born. Pharaoh said, I want that child. I want every male, male child. I want him killed because I hear there's a deliverer coming from them. All these aborted children are targets. Because the enemy doesn't want the anointed ones to rise up and destroy his kingdom. You're a target. God, the devil saw the potential that you have in God, and he, and he tried to destroy it before you even got to know God. 
He destroyed it by your addictions. He destroyed it with your being sidetracked with the perversions of the world. And when you come to God, you can't find it because you feel a little less than because of where you came from. The truth is, and this is a hard truth to understand. Therefore, if any man be in Christ is a new creature, you have the authority and the power of God to hold your head up high as if you've never done nothing wrong. You hear what I'm saying? I walk, around, I walk around and conduct myself as if I've never told a lie. Not to lie. <laughs> I've never done nothing wrong. Why? Because everything i ever done is under the blood. And I believe that. You may not act like it. It don't matter. As long as I act like it. I believe. I believe that God is able to do super abundantly. John 10.10. You were a target from the devil, and some of you are, are remaining a victim to him. You never came out of that victim mentality. World's not against you because you're black, brown, white. Right now, the world's against everybody white. I'm not saying, I'm telling you what the news is saying. Everybody gets their shot. Let's read. So the thief came to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He did not wait for you to get saved. He did not wait for you to get revelation of who Jesus was. My destruction started when I was born, when my mother gave me away to another family. My destruction started the day I was born. The enemy says, let me destroy this life because he may find God. And if he gets God, there's no telling what happens to him. Right. You are a target from the enemy. And some of you are playing right in his hands because you don't believe the power of God is available for you. And it is available for you, but you've got to stop your foolishness. Because the lies that you've been believing about you and, about, uh, and, and more importantly about other people have become a stronghold in your life that keep you bound. And you cannot move forward to God when you got a stronghold in your mind. You can't, you can't accept the freedom of God when you got a stronghold in your mind. What's a stronghold in my mind? You were told you were fat. You were told you were stupid. You were told you were ugly. You were told you'd never amount to anything. You were told you were useless. So then you fell into the lies of the world and went from woman to woman or from man to man, got used and abused as you come into the church and you're tore up and you have no peace, you have no self-worth, you have no value and you're looking at the rest of the world and the rest of the Christian faith and you're destroying and attacking them because you are perverted. Hello? These are lies that are never exposed in the church. But these are lies that need to be exposed so that you can walk in the freedom of an almighty God. Because when the world and your family and everybody knows what you come out of and they see something different in you, they know that it's God. It took over 20 years, 20 years for my family to see God in me. You know why it took over 20 years? Because it took well over 20 years for them to see the devil alive and active in me. And they saw, all they saw in me was flipping faces. They had to realize this face today that Jesus put in me is real. And I was tested and I was tried. But now they know that it's real. Those strongholds that we have don't allow us to even worship him. And here's what the scripture says. You, everybody wants the promises of God. Beloved, I wish all things you made be prosperous. Yes, Lord, I believe in prosperity because you said it. Well, he also said, lift up them feeble hands to hang down. He also said, worship him in the beauty of his holiness. But you're going to stand there. Why? Because I'm bound. I'm bound to what you think of me. I'm bound. I'm afraid you're looking at me when I'm doing this. Well, if you don't like this, you ain't going to like this. Give them something to talk about. Our lives are molded by what we deem as true. You believe you're a failure because you were told you'd be a failure. You believe you're a quitter because you were told you're going to be a quitter. I believe that my destiny was going to be Alcatraz, and Alcatraz was open when I was a young man. 
going across the bridge, Bunker said, that's your future home. I believed it. Not because I wanted it, because it was beat in my head. How many understand that? And then when somebody tells us what the power of God can t- do for us, we go, I doubt that. You know why we doubt it? Because there's not enough men and women of faith that are standing and holding up the torch. Not enough men and women of faith that are standing and, say, and, and, and doing what Paul told Timothy, be thou an example. You get yours and you drop dead. You get yours and you drop out of the race. You get yours and you stop being involved. Oh my God, you're a broken record. I'm going to keep playing this song until it takes root in our heart. Because somebody was there for you when you got yours. Somebody sacrificed and gave their life for you to get where you're at. Hallelujah. I have no help, so I'm stuck where I'm at. Many of us live like that elephant in the circus. Never realizing the potential that lies within us and succumb to the frailties of the strength of the strongholds in our minds. You see, when, when, when uh, 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 um, they put, get a baby elephant in a circus, they put a big rope around it and they tether it to the ground and he tries to go past the rope he go, only goes as far as he can with the rope and he realizes that he doesn't have enough strength. So he goes back and he stays within the confines of the length of that rope. Well, you know what? When that elephant is full grown, the rope doesn't get any bigger, nor does it get any stronger. But they have subjected the will of the elephant into thinking that rope is holding him bound. It's not the rope that's holding him bound because you know he tried a hundred times it's his thoughts about the rope that's holding him bound. Do you hear what I'm saying? It's not your addiction. It's what you think about your addiction. It's not the devil. It's what you think about the devil. Because God is there to cut the rope. But you don't think he can. Come on, ask somebody, are you an elephant? Many of us live our lives like that elephant. Elephant. Never realizing the strength and the potential that we have. I've said this a thousand times and I'll say it a thousand more. I think alcoholics and drug addicts are the weakest people on the face of the earth. And I don't mean to uh, 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 um, uh, um, attack anybody, all right? But I'm talking as one that was. I couldn't handle anything. A disappointment, guess what I did? Got loaded. I was happy, guess what I did? I was sad, angry, amen. I couldn't handle anything. But because of him, the strongholds are broke. When I'm weak, he is strong. You do not have to remain that way if you stop believing the lies that are being perpetuated upon you. Our thoughts have become self-imposed limitations. And the enemy knows how to play on our thoughts. If you started your drug abuse or your alcohol abuse, or it doesn't just have to be that. It could be anything. And you started it in an early age. You think you're stuck in that rut and you're never going to get out. That's a self-imposed limitation that you'll never get away from. One of the self-imposed limitations that that, that, that has us bound today is education. Amen. I can't do this because I'm not educated. I can't do this because I don't have that degree. I don't have this degree. So I guess I'm just stuck in this dead-end, go-nowhere job. The dead-end, go-nowhere job is not what's holding you back. It's your thought about that dead end, going to work job. You think that's all you're worth. I got men here in this church that are convicted felons that worked in banks with money. How'd they get that, God? 
See, the Bible says, I can do all things. This is the power of God. I can do all things through Christ. It's not, I can do all things because I got this degree. Not, I can do all things because that degree or the other, the other degree. I could pass any job interview. Guaranteed. I've been training me my whole life to pass interviews. It's the background checks that mess me up. But even so, there's some background checks that God opened up the door anyway. Because I didn't go in there and say, oh, man, I'm, they're going to do a background check. I'm like, I said, God, if this is you, open up the door. Right. See, we don't give God a chance because we shut the door based on our limitations or our lack of ability before the door is even open. Hello? Thinking that God ain't going to do something. My wife, when she was going to school and her and my brother were out having lunch one day and they were across the street from this company and, and, and she looked up and she goes, you know what, I'm going to go in there and see if they're hiring. The lady tells her, you know, we're, to hire, we're not hiring, but you know, what? we're going to open up a, a position for you. Hello? Because she didn't put no limitation on herself. You see, when you're serving God, Get away from those strongholds, because those strongholds are self-imposed limitations. I'm going to read a list to you about billionaires who did not finish high school. Did not finish high school. What's the difference between them and you? Limitations. You think it's all you have, this is what you're worth, and you don't want to pay the price. Hallelujah. They did not graduate high school. Debbie Fields. Mrs. Fields Cookies. <laughs> Listen to this. Her net worth from a cookie. <laughs> the Bible says, God is the author of witty inventions. Amen. You got a witty invention birthed inside of you. There's birthing inside of you that wants to come out, but it can't come out till you get past those self-imposed limitations. Stop saying I can't. Start saying I can. Stop living yourself and start living for him. $65 million is her net worth. From a cookie. I can't buy her cookies. Richard Branson. Virgin Airlines. $5 billion. Did not graduate high school. Ray Kroc, first CEO for McDonald's. In 1984, he died, but his net worth was $600 million. This is the man that had the foresight, or the hindsight, the foresight, to see vision through the McDonald's brothers. As they let me buy this from you. And these guys are so ignorant, they sold it. Hallelujah. Not understanding it. Henry Ford. Wait a minute. You have to have engineering to make cars because everything relates to everything else in current state. No high school diploma. Now, those of you that, you know, were a little bit better off than the rest of us, you might have went to college, got a year or two year college. And what are you doing with it? Yeah. <laughs> Do you know how many men, women I know that went to Bible school that are driving buses? Yeah. Come on now. Driving Uber. Come on. Wasting all that time in Bible school and not even applying it. Not working in their life. Right. You went to Bible college thinking that that degree is going to get you something. You may have that degree, but you got that self-imposed limitation. I'm not against college. I'm not against those of you who know me. I push you for school. I push for your education because I think it's important. But it is not the key. Because you can have all that, and you can still have those self-imposed limitations based on the lies that were told to you. These are college dropouts. Bill Gates. $126 billion. That's his worth. Why? No self-imposed limitation. He was willing to pay the price to go after what he wanted. 
See, some of us don't want nothing, better, nothing more than, the better, than, than, than a better high than we had last night. Steve Jobs, $10.2 billion. Zuckerberg, $71 million. Michael Dell from Dell Computers, $50 billion. Simon Cow. <laughs> Did not, a college dropout. So what I'm saying is, by saying all this, I'm telling you the world system is not the only system. It's a system that puts you in bondage. And if we've tried to walk in the freedom that God has for us and get in that system because after all, I want to prosper, I want to be, I want, I want to be somebody, you're not going to become what God wants you to become. He is worth $600 million. Wow. Call it a dropout. So get over yourself. Amen. Get over your self-imposed limitations and realize your lifestyle has you exactly, the choices of your lifestyle have you exactly where you're at, and it ain't going to change because you become a Christian overnight. Because one of the lies we're told is, is if you're in trouble, just call on the name of Jesus, and everything will be all right. Just get prayed for, everything will be all right. Just fast, everything will be all right. Read your Bible, everything will be all right. I don't know about you, but I've done all that, and it didn't get all right. You may not like it, and you look, well, what's wrong with you? Well, let's be real. How many of us here have done everything we're supposed to do, and it wasn't all right? We hit a brick wall. And so we don't want to feel like we're a bad Christian. So it's, oh, well, he knows best. Now, where's your trust in somebody who knows best who's beating you up? Where's your trust in an almighty God who knows best and not giving you the, the, what you need for, to succeed in life? You're not going to have trust in that God when you need to have trust in him, when he's let you down time and time and time again in your mind. Maybe a couple here want to be real enough to admit that. Most people have felt that God has let them down so much they don't know if they could trust him. God did not let you down. You let yourself down. Because you made excuses. And you stopped going forward. Because of the lies in your head. Instead of acting on the word, we made excuses. Instead of believing his word, we made excuses. Well, you know, I'd be better off if I had a better job. Well, you don't get a better job till you prove yourself on this job. You don't become a better employee and get raises after they give you the raise. You work hard before you get the raise. You prove yourself before you get the raise. But see, we're so full of ourselves. Man, I've been coming every day on time for a week. See, excuses are nothing more than self-imposed limitations. What's your excuse for where you're at today? So I've never been one that bought into my excuses. I did what I did because I liked doing what I did. Bottom line, I didn't like the consequences. That sucked, right? But I liked the lifestyle. So you can't even be that real. You mean to tell me you didn't like partying? Not one person in here didn't like partying? I liked it so much I did it till I couldn't pick my head up off the floor. And then I did it again. Because it was all so good, but I didn't like the consequences of partying. So I said there's got to be something different. See how delusional, self-delusional we can be? So no, my life was miserable. They used to crack me up. Christians said, your life was miserable. How? I wake up at noon. I party till 2 in the morning. If I want to go to work, I go to work. If I don't want to go to work, I go hustle some money. My life is great. So my life was not miserable. 
It was paying the consequences that made my life miserable. But I can't buy into, for me, excuses for the things that I've done because there were choices that I made. But what excuses are you using to keep, where you, keep you where you're at? I can't get a break. I can't, nobody will help me. Things never work right for me. I don't know what I'm going to do. We're like the man in the pool of Bethesda. We make more excuses than we do apply the word. Jesus, in Luke chapter 14, Jesus told him, will thou be made whole? Yeah, but Jesus, every time the water got troubled, somebody comes by and they get in there first. I didn't ask you that. He said, do you want to be made whole? You see, you know, he, it's interesting because he didn't say, do you want to be healed? Many of us are looking for secondary instead of primary. Being whole means I'm free here, I'm free here. Many of us want to be free physically. I don't want to be bound to the sinful nature of the world. I don't want to be bound to the addictions and the pain of this life. But my sick, sadic, sad, uh, 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 sadistic thoughts, I don't want to surrender those. Because after all, they're my identity. I don't want to surrender those because after all, the perversions that happen to me as a child, if I let them go, I don't know who I am because I can't blame my shortcomings and my failure on anybody else. I know you didn't expect to come hear this today. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. You know, when you have some cement, you can lay the cement, but the cement has to set before it's usable. The truth of God has to set in your spirit. We hear, oh, I got that, I'm free. No, you ain't. Give the word some time to settle in your spirit. Mull over it and walk in it. It will be tested, it will be tried. And when you come forth like pure gold, it'll be so set that you'll be fixed and the enemy can't rob you. And the first time we have a setback, the first time something bad happens, the first time we fall, the first time we fail, I knew it when I tried this for you. weren't set in the word yet. Get back up. Get the word of God in you, pressed down, shaken together, running. I know we use that scripture for money. But get the word of God in you, pressed down, shaken together, run over. Let it set and try it again. Why do we quit? Day after day after day after day after day. It's not because you're destined for that. It's because that is the stronghold in your life. I don't want to pay the price. I don't want to struggle. I just want things to come my way. They're not going to just come your way. You got to chase, you got to aggressively chase them. Because the enemy's been robbing you through the strongholds of your mind your entire life, and you've been falling for the okie doke. At some point, you got to look at the man in the mirror and say, you know what? I'm tired. Whatever it takes, I'm going to win this race. And you know what the scripture says about the race you're in? It's not to the swift nor the strong, but he that endures to the end. I may not win every single battle, but I'll win every single round that I decide to get back in. Don't give up. To overcome in the church. Hey, how many know you need to overcome in the church? Turn around and look at the person next to you. Look at the other one. Look at the one behind you. One of them, I'm not going to say which one, <laughs> but one of them is going to do everything they can within their ability because they don't know they're a messenger of Satan. Amen. Everything within their ability to stop you from getting your victory. 
They'll not shake your hand. They'll not befriend you. They'll neglect you. They'll reject you. They'll talk about you. And if you're still bound to the strongholds in your mind, that's it. I know they're all a bunch of hypocrites in here. Yeah, we have hypocrites. But not everybody's a hypocrite. Find them that aren't and connect with them and get the help that you need. I'm not even going to tell you which ones the hypocrites are. <laughs> Hallelujah. Truth is, as a believer, this isn't taught to us. See, and I don't understand this. I really don't. I wish they would have told me this. As a believer, I'm going to have some hard times. As a believer, there's going to be some times I don't want to get up out of bed. As a believer, there's going to be some days I just want to smash everybody and everything, and then I can't tell you why. I'm just tired of humbling myself. I'm tired of you coming at me any twisted way you think you can and me not saying nothing to you. I think this is my day. Hello? Let me know I'm talking right. Nobody ever prepared me for those days. So guess what? I had to learn the hard way how to prepare for those days. You may not like what I'm saying. You may like it for a moment, but my God, after 20 years, it's like, man, you still beat me up. No, we ain't there yet. And if you have the mindset that I'm beating you up, you got the wrong kind of mindset. I want to prepare you for the hard times you're going to have in the faith. Because I get, listen to this, you will be neglected and rejected more than you will be accepted and appreciated, even in the faith. And because of the strongholds in your minds, it can drive you out. That's why we have so many transplants in churches today. Because they've never been rooted and founded in the word to learn how to deal with the hardships of Christianity. And they're looking for that perfect little church where everybody just loves one another. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. No, oh, I love you. I love you. I love you. No, I love you. No, I love you. No, I love you. I love you more. <laughs> My God. We found a church like that. We went camping one year. Hallelujah. And they thought Brother Fred was the pastor. And I ain't the kind of guy, no, that's me. No, I ain't that kind of guy. I slid in the background. And I watched them swoop on him. And I went outside, and I'm looking in the window. They're trying to court him, and they're pouring all this love on him. They're, oh, we got this, and we got that. Going, oh, yeah. It was too much love for us. Hallelujah. Are you prepared for hard times? Are you prepared for the hard time you're going to have tomorrow? Listen, some of us can't even deal with a hard time from our spouse, let alone your Christian brother or sister. Let me share this with you. You live with a woman 24-7. I'm speaking from a man's perspective. 24-7, you're going to have some hard times. She said yep from a woman's perspective. But I said a double yep from a man's perspective. You're going to have some hard times. And guess what happens if you don't learn how to deal with it? This would be my fifth wife. Because I couldn't deal with it. You're not going to wake up one day and go, oh, I got this now. The Bible says, train a child up in the ways that he should go. Yes. Now, I know he's talking about children. But what are we when we first get saved? Talk to me. And we're not being trained in righteousness. We're being trained in religious deeds. We're being trained in religious doctrine. Nobody trained me how to be a man of God. Nobody trained me how to deal with the enemy. Nobody trained me how to deal with you when you ain't right. Hallelujah. See, so two people come to me with, a, or one person comes to me with a problem with somebody else. What's the first thing I ask them? Talk to me. 
What are you doing about it? I don't care what they did, how you handling it. If you ain't handling it right, ain't nothing going to work right. Did you learn something today? Come on, give the Lord a shout. We'll probably finish this next week.